chemical substance and sort of how people treat information in the real world. And it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so who am I? I have a, you know, a couple degrees in chemistry, a PhD in physical chemistry from University of Georgia. I, I studied evidential quantum chemistry. I worked in small and, life, uh, small and large life science type companies. I've done consulting work with data systems. Uh, I've over 20 years of chemical expertise, information, informatics, and scientific data systems. So people kind of know me as, as having um, worked on the PubChem project pretty much from its inception, where I, I help lead and manage it. So uh, just in case you don't know what PubChem is, it's a resource that people use. It's organized in three different areas uh, where we have people who have chemical substance descriptions. They put it inside PubChem. And then they have, they run experiments on them. We call them bioactivities, where they describe those experiments and, and give us information. So we're an open archive and a public resource. So it's a place where people can take their heterogeneous data and they can throw it into our, our gamish and we have to sort it out. It's fun. So uh, just to give you some idea, we're, we're not working with small numbers of things. We're talking tens, hundreds of millions of things. When you consider links between them, you're talking trillions. So it's, it's not a lot of data. You could put it on a, an SSD, four terabyte drive, probably most of the content that you care about. And, but it's the complexity of the links between things that really make it the big data part. What's the definition of the difference between the com uh, compound and the substance? Uh, the tangled web we weave. I will get into it. I didn't want to talk about PubChem, but I do want to talk about what is a chemical substance. It's a very simple question, and it's not really a simple answer. So if you think about it, the, you go to Wikipedia, it'll give you the, the, the usual textbook answer as to what a chemical substance is. It's a form of matter that has constant composition and characteristic properties. Uh, you think of it as, um, I don't know, water is a typical thing, or mercury oxide, you know, sucrose type of sugar an element like sulfur or copper. But you know, there's a, a series of properties of chemical substances. The, the general thing here is you can't separate it out any further. And this is sort of the, the classic scientific definition of what a chemical substance is. But it, it kind of breaks down. Uh, there's this concept of non-sweekiometric uh, compounds. So your matter isn't really a constant. You have a Typically, these are metals and, and various types of crystalline properties. Uh, for whatever reason, you have a perfect lattice, but then every once in a while, there's an atom missing or an extra one present that shouldn't be there. And then you run into something that's a little bit different, so you, you start to break down. And, and these are the things that are, are fairly well known in certain cases. Um, there's the important classes of superconductors. Uh, in the case of palladium hydrides, it, it absorbs hydrogen reversibly. So they think in terms of hydrogen storage. Uh, there's common uh, minerals that people think about, um, ferrous oxide as well, where you have these sort of ordered disorders, for lack of better words. So there's, there's also this, uh, in geology, if you have a uniform composition, you're called a mineral. If you have multiple minerals together or some aggregate, you're called a rock. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that there's quite a number of minerals that mutually dissolve into solid solutions. And this kind of blows your mind, because how could you have a solution if it's a solid? Well, some of these things are made up, well, the, these rocks are you know, made in volcanic environments, and you have these two different things, they're in a solution together, and, and then you, you know, it goes solid. And you've got this beautiful looking, uh, you know, so-called iridescent you know, moon rock, and it's very pretty, but um, it's made up of, of aluminum silicates that have you know, a certain percentage of potassium and a certain percentage of sodium, and it's a uniform thing. You would think it was just one. It's not. It's, it's a couple things in there. Uh, then you have this concept of uh, polymers. Uh, a polymer, it, you have some chemical substance entity which is discrete and pure, or you could even have a mixture of these, and then you, you group them together and you make these long chains. And you know, we know about a lot of them. That, you know, they're natural biopolymers. You've got starch, it's because it's different sugars, uh, DNA, RNA, 
protein chains of amino acids. I mean, these are the types of polymers, but um, they can also be synthetic, and, and they're, they're not really described as a discrete chemical structure might be. You think of it more in terms of these are the monomers that were involved, this is the reaction about how I made it, and then I got some weight range of products out because it's not one thing, it's, it's a whole ensemble of things that together looks uniform and looks the same, but it, it's not. And so if you're working with polyethylene, it's, it's made up of uh, a gas as a monomer. It comes, you know, if you're making hydrocarbons and you get um, ethylene out more or less, but you can polymerize it in certain cases and make these beautiful long chains and they become like waxes. Um, and we know about them because, well, you know, we have these little recycling codes and we think of four and two, well, that's because you're working with polyethylene and one is a slightly more dense form than the other uh, and which makes it really quite uh, neat. So, but really, you know, a lot of these that you see here, uh, polystyrene, polypropylene and others, you know, they're, they're plastics, but they don't really, you think of it as uniform, you look at it, it's clear, it, it seems like to be the one substance, but it's just a whole bunch of different stuff, but many of us still think of it as a substance. Uh, you can also have a, a legal definition uh, for what a chemical substance is, and well, uh, it's similar to polymers. You know, you, you made something and you got it, and well, it's, to call it something different is kind of an oddball. We don't want to put it in a separate database. We just want to have it all together, so we're going to call that a substance too. Uh, and a chemical substance, and so EU, they had this, this REACH thing for the reassessment of, of their you know, chemicals. They define mono-constituent substances, multi-constituent substances, and substances of unknown or variable composition. And so you got this stuff, and you can establish some form of identity for it, um, but you know, it may be that you're just referencing some process. And if you think about it, lots of natural products could be this way. Uh, you, you have some extract or something that you have, and, and they haven't really isolated what those things are, because really it's a whole mixture of stuff. You know, think of cocaine. It's not necessarily pure. Um, you got a, a bunch of different stuff potentially there. Uh, not just what you think is there, but other things too. Um, and, you know, you, you made it in some way, but it looks like the same thing. Uh, you know, charcoal is an example. It, it's um, extremely complex. It's partially polymeric type uh, thing and, well, you can't quite say what it is, but you can identify it. You know what it is. Um, but so it's, it's really, it's identified to a sufficient accuracy and that's good enough. And we'll call that a chemical substance because we can identify it, it's uniform. Um, but it, it may not necessarily be what you think. It is. So, so what's the threshold? Like, how far? What is sufficiently accurate? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can if you can create a process for it, if you can describe it adequately, uh, you know FDA, EPA, EU, Reach, you know the, the European Chemical a Agency, ETHA, you know they'll say yeah. You, you made a, and you can look at their long list of things that they describe in law, and they have these things that say, you know, product from the distillation and fractionation column, and blah, blah, blah. And it has a cast number, and it has some name like thing. I couldn't tell you what it is. I mean, it, it, it's, it's there. You can isolate it. <laughs> I can give it to you in the tanker car load. <laughs> But well, what is it? I, I, you know, that's a good question. And they can regulate it for its words. Well, of course, because you made it. I mean, it's it's the stuff that's at the bottom. Uh, you know, maybe it's the good stuff. I don't know. Uh, so you know, the the real world use kind of mirrors the legal use. Um, you can define a chemical substance, and we'll call it a chemical substance, even if it's a mixture. Uh, we don't really care, and so if you can assign a name and you can identify and isolate it, you can sell it or think of it, you know, we can call it a chemical substance. And, you know, it, it may 
be a pure substance and a solvent, but we're just going to ignore the solvent, even though it's there in, in micromolar quantities. We'll declare that this is that thing that we were thinking about, even though it's like a speck, you know, it's just, it's barely in there at all, but, you know, that, that's what we're saying it is, even though it's not. Um, and we have this whole problem about we ignore certain bits of information as stereoisomers, which is to say that as a left hand and a right hand, we, we saw some of that with the cis and the trans and, and so on, but, but also the salt forms may be, you know, embraced or ignored. Uh, depending on what happens. Hydrates, if we know about what those are, they may be completely ignored because if it's in solution, well, what's a hydrating? But if it's in solid, wow, you might really want to know the molecular weight of that thing. I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I, I, I can believe that, guys. So, uh, well, I hate to say it, but chemically oriented data is very troublesome, and if you don't come to grips with chemical substance type information and nanomaterials as being problematic, you're in for a world of hurt. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we already are trying to understand what happens at the surface because that's what makes the properties unique and helpful. And if you don't understand what's going on there, you've got this wonderful nanomaterial, uh, uh, I don't know, some type of catalyst that does fantastic things that makes your manufacturing process go at 10 times the speed. It's worth its weight in gold. And it's very important, but, you know, what are you going to do? Um, if you don't know what's happening at the surface, who knows what's going on? So let's talk chemical information. Uh, it, it's worthwhile to know that there aren't any really global rules or standards. You know, every individual chemist or scientist can kind of invent whatever it is that they need when they need to do it. And it could be that within an organization, they might try and normalize things between the different scientists. They might even have a group involved in that. One company I worked at, they had basically a team of five people that were the registry. And people would submit their things there, and then the registry would do all this extra work to, to normalize and, and make it even orient the molecules in, in a way in the depictions so that they were, they were just so. And, you know, it was very important, but they also weighed out and, and kept the samples and, and all that. Um, but the other thing is, is that they're depictions typically of, of chemical, if you have a chemical structure at all, it's for humans to interpret. It's, um, well, it's a, it's a pretty picture that you as a scientist would interpret and, and try and learn from and can, you know, pretty much immediately know what's going on. But uh, if you're a computer, you might have a little hard time with that because it doesn't really understand the implicit parts of, of um, what humans do. Uh, and if you get data from many different organizations, you can end up with some really weird stuff where they shoehorn stuff in and or overload the way that they draw a structure to mean other additional information, such as five bonds to carbon or six bonds to carbon, which is completely unallowed, but maybe it's because there's some type of assault situation that they're trying to explain. And that may be to other organic elements or salts or to uh, inorganics and it completely violate all the rules of chemistry but they know what's going on because that's their business rule about how they want to register their chemicals. And they maybe did that for some reason. I don't know why. But it's, you know, it's, if you create a set of normalization rules, you can really come into a situation where you, you've described everything in a particular standard way, and then you get a new load of data in. And you get a whole new set of ways in which you need to think of your information that you never thought of before. Or, you know, something which is really rare that you see maybe one in a million, they give you a few thousand of those or a hundred thousand of those, and now it's like one in ten or one in a hundred, and you really have to pay attention. And the hard thing is that there's so many different ways that you can draw the exact same thing. So here's a very simple molecule, uh, organic molecule, guanine, and you don't have to know any chemistry. This isn't a test. But you'll notice that these all look slightly different but yet they're all the same way of drawing the same thing. And this is just one simple molecule. So tautomers and resonance forms of the same chemical are really quite prolific. Uh, resonance mean that the double bonds can move around and, and tautomeric typically means a hydrogen that's there can move to another part of the molecule and it can still be the same thing legitimately. A hard part here is 
if you put the same chemical in a different solvent, water, DMSO, I don't know, you name whatever it happens to be, hexanol or whatever, it might prefer this one or it might prefer that one. It goes completely different based on its environment, the dielectrics of, of the medium that it's in. So if you're really interested in, in DMSO or, or water, you might draw the molecule in a different way and you may think about the chemistry of something in a, in a rather different fashion. Um, and, but typically what you end up with is, is a ratio of these of some form. And so you typically have to know that it means the same thing. And so we'll ignore all these other structural forms and just figure it's this, but even though that a very specific one may be the one that's really important. And so we have to kind of fuzz over some of that when we normalize the data and it, it gets a little tricky. Yeah, salts. Even simple salts. Here we have sodium acetate. Um, well, some people draw it as acetic acid and sodium metal. And of course, you're a chemist, you know how to do the reaction. But this has an extra hydrogen in it that shouldn't be there because that goes reacts with water somewhere. And well, I don't know, something happened there. But this would be a really exothermic reaction. You ever put sodium in water? <laughs> Um, but you know, you can put the charges on there, the formal charges, or maybe just draw a bond between them. You know, people just kind of do their own thing. But the computer doesn't know that this is that and that is this and, or anything about them unless you teach it, it. And if you have to teach so many rules to the computer, it, the program gets really big and complex and buggy and it's not fun. And then, well, the context can change. So if you're a chemist, you know, sodium acetate you might think of as this, but um, you know, if you're looking for you know, uh, the dielectric in IV bags, you might think of the trihydrate. But you might refer to them both as sodium acetate. Oh, well, yeah, it's always a trihydrate if it's a solid form because it's hydroscopic. So if you think about the same thing, you would both refer to these as sodium acetate. But you might say this is the sodium acetate trihydrate, but everybody just leaves that off. That's a sodium acetate. So, you know, we have this idea that these things can kind of interconvert and migrate. And you can ionize, not ionize. Some people register chemicals based on what happens inside at, at physiological pH. So they'll ionize the things naturally if you go to Kebi or others, and they may or may not refer to it as it being the ionized form because they're trying to think more in terms of you know, what that form might be. So it, you know, it, because you have all this sort of going on, and also for th these types of solutions and situations, if you small, add a small amount of acid or base, or a little bit of heating, like even just maybe the, the warmth of your hand, you can get these things to interconvert and become something else. But if you normalize these, you know, what form do you prefer? Or even worse, which form does your software prefer? Because it may do this for you automatically without you knowing. So you get into this problem where you wonder, where has the structure been? I tell you. Uh, there are different chemical file formats, and if you convert between them, that conversion can be lossy. Oh, where have you been? My goodness. And with whom have you been? <laughs> you have different software packages and different versions of, of the same software package or between different vendors they might do th things to your structure that you did not intend. And you might feel violated in some sort of way because your original information is no longer original because when you wrote it out, it became something else. Maybe. So the rise of the machines. Um, now imagine that you did this on a huge scale. We have databases now in the millions of entities. PubChem, we have tens of millions of things. So 
if you create your normalizer, it's like these robotic machines doing things to your structures where your original data may become corrupted. In fact, we can look at some of the information contributed to us. We could even identify what they did and when they did it based on you know, the types of problems that we see. Aromaticity is a huge issue for us because there's this concept of aromatizing your molecule or only showing it in an aromatic form versus the Kekulé form where you have all the single double bonds drawn out. Because different software versions don't speak the same aromaticity as other software versions. And so you can add the additional removal of hydrogen in the process of aromatizing and then keculizing your molecule. So when you do this on a grand scale, you start to see really bizarre stuff. These are all nitro groups. We see them like 70 different ways. Some we only see a, a small handful of times, but some we see with quite regularity. You know, it's a shorthand notion for many people to draw two double bond oxygens to nitrogen to represent that this is some type of a resonance going on with nitrogen. But in some cases, they just leave the hydrogen, I mean, they just leave the charges off and it's just, you know, some type of an OH group on your nitrogen. Or azides is another fun one. There's like over 81 different ways that we see azides drawn. And, you know, we're supposed to realize, recognize this is the same thing. I mean, this is mission impossible. I mean, they're just leaps of faith that we just can't do. So when you think about all the different, you know, groups of molecules and, and resources out there on the internet, and you have robochemistry going on where they each have their own normalization approach when they gather and aggregate content. It's kind of like um, you know, these, these nuclear bombs going off at each of the different repositories around the world, and that's what these sort of represent. Um, you know, we have these wastelands of chemical structures where you know, we're modifying them in some sort of um, un, unsavory way uh, where it's no longer what people originally had. But so, you know, what do you do? Well, you build a better robot. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, inside PubChem, we, we have people who contribute chemical substances, and when it has compound uh, chemical content, we normalize it into a single unique entity, and we go through a bunch of steps. But what we do is we keep the original entity, and we then normalize and we derive it into something else. So we can rerun our rules at any time, again and again, revise as a function of time without touching the original content. And so if you're going to do something with yours, you know, try and keep the original content because as a function of time, you might think about things in a little bit different way. And if you can't go back to the original data, because what's scary is that the people will take what you did to their stuff and they'll ingest it and then give it back to you. <laughs> we see that. So it's scary. But sadly, if you create rules, um, you're always fighting the last war. New contributor, new chemical representation. Uh, this was what we had for tosyl azide. And then um, we got some data from the IBM Watson project. And we got new representations we never quite saw before for azides. And we didn't have a rule for it. And so it was kind of a, oh. Well, it just. The software package that they were using, that's what they would do. <laughs> so, um, but we're also working not just within chemical representations, we're, because we have full atom descriptions of, of many molecules, and, and these are, uh, you know, carbohydrates, uh, they have their own way of depicting things that are different than others because when you have these kind of large sugars, uh, and this is a small one, <laughs> by the way, um, you can understand what's going on really quite easily in their pictogram type form, but different omics have their own languages and ways of thinking about stuff. And it's not just the carbohydrate chemics, the chemists uh, working in glucomics, but there are lots of entities uh, as well which are, well, um, peptides. And they chemically modify them in some sort of way. But when you look at it in this fashion, you may not recognize this for what it really is. But in these short 
shorter hand no notations, you, you can. Um, I'm just giving you some more examples. There's another saccharide, but you can see that our way of depiction things, they're starting to overlap and it's getting harder and harder to see what's going on. This one, you have almost no clue what's going on, but in these types of approaches where you, you can see all the different amino acids, you have a better sense. One of the reasons why I show this to you is that some of these are very important. They're, they're well known for one thing or another. They're substances that they can isolate. In this case, it comes from you know, a, a natural product, it has a known uh, activity of some form. Um, it's very useful and, and you can purchase it, uh, but the description can be kind of hard sometimes to understand if you want to search it and do something more with it. Um, just a couple more, but the key thing here is that for how the biology works, there are a lot of these so-called post-translational modifications. This is, you know, your genome, it makes a protein sequence and then it does stuff, you know, your body does stuff to turn parts on and off. And so if you understand the biological function or role, you might have a protein where if you phosphorylate it once, it turns into the active form. If you double phosphorylate it at that same spot, it becomes a superactive form. If you phosphorylate somewhere else in the molecule, it might turn it off completely, whether it's in the active or superactive form. Any of those could be a disease state. So as you're trying to understand how things happen, you can't just have a sequence to describe it. You need to have the actual chemical detail and be able to work with it. And so we're getting increasing larger amounts of these larger biomolecules that are sort of stretching the rules of what we do. And so we're sort of having to adapt. I mean, this is kind of, looks like a, a roller coaster ride, <laughs> right? Um, but, but these are real thing. This is a, a snake uh, venom. Um, but, you know, these things have known biological function roles. They're studying them, they're isolating them. Um, and, but the nice thing is to be able to handle it. And as a function of time, I mean, we weren't initially asked to, to do this. Uh, we were just focused mostly on small molecules, but people were having more and more large molecules. In fact, if you look at the top grossing drugs, you know, only three out of the top 10 in the world or in the U.S. are so-called small molecules. All the rest of these large biomolecules of one form or another. And so as the community changes and they say, oh, well, PubChem's there, we can just throw data in, they will. But, I mean, you, even these things, they break down and that they become sort of difficult to see what's going on. This is a, this another saccharide. Anyway, it gets better. Um, so most chemistry knowledge, this is a premise, uh, is locked up in text. Uh, it, it's not really a premise. There's billions of pages of chemistry text. EPA, uh, World Health Organization, others have thousand page documents about a single chemical. There's a treasure trove of data that's stored in them and it costs them oftentimes millions of dollars to create these reports. But who's gonna read through all these thousands of pages on a single chemical, let alone you know, billions of pages of, of chemistry text? So really what we have here is almost all of the knowledge is now locked up in a PDF or other types of, of, of pay systems that we have to you know, read content and, and then abstract things out. Everything, you know, being pretty much geared towards a human. So here's a simplistic science workflow, you know, read papers, do science, publish papers, search papers. And we use the computer and all of this to help us. Um, but yet we rely on humans to abstract out the key words, the article gist, the data, because well, you know, we didn't teach the computer what it is that we did. We just used it in the most basic and shallow way. So we have uh, folks like the Chemical Abstract Service, uh, a National Library of Medicine where I work, they have Medline for the biomedical literature, uh, Kemble for things more drug discovery oriented at EBI, where they're going through and, and abstracting stuff out of the literature to try and find out what's going on. Uh, IDB was another example for the immunology uh, side pulling out all the epitopes. But it'd be great if, if the computers could do a little bit more to help us out. Um, in terms of computer-aided abstraction, there's these bio-creatives that have been going on. But the really notable thing is that last year, we've finally gotten to the point where 
computers are just as good as a human curator, a bio-trained curator, of picking out entities like chemical names, disease names, and gene names. So the recall rate is like over um, you know, 90% uh, for computers now to do all this, which is really quite good. And so we've been playing around with the, the one that was the, the top winner, which was Pubtator, which is uh, made by NCBI, where I work of all places. Uh, and also uh, this um, uh, package called LeadMine from uh, Forehanded Bandit there. Um, no, this is uh, Next Move Software. So it's, it's really showing promise that we're, we're getting somewhere. Uh, however, the so-called natural language processing, which attempts to read text, is not quite there yet. It's, it's really quite poor still. But the, faint, the fact that we can do name entity recognition, or NER, fairly well, uh, at least means that NLP can, can get there, hopefully, eventually. My hope is that we'll be there in five to 10 years. And uh, I hope that we're ready for them when this data deluge can start. So um, you can experience computer understanding just by going to Google or Siri. Siri, what time is it? Wow, he can speak my language, right? You know, you can ask natural language questions, and if the computer really understands, no matter if you were vague about what it is, it can come up with something which is reasonable for you to, to understand. So uh, you can already know what this is like or what it could be like. In fact, if you go to Google and say, what is the boiling point of benzene, <laughs> it'll tell you. <laughs> but if you go to someplace like PubChem, we'll say, all right, something that mentions boiling point and benzene, all right, and the names, yeah. Um, uh, this thing boils benzene or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, why, but why, why don't you use Google as a back engine? Is, is that not possible? Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so <laughs> how do we bring it all together? Uh, so we, we're, we're trying to work towards knowledge representation. And so we're just trying to take you know, the information that we know about, because we've, I mean, we've got all these links between things. Um, but we can Im imagine that we can use the computer and get it to a point where it can understand what, really what's going on and how we can and represent uh, well, everything that we know today. So we're lucky. Uh, chemical information is, is everywhere now. You can just search benzaldehyde. You know, you, you even find PubChem here. Uh, You'll notice these nice little chem box, which were one of the sources for those. And you can get to a record that tells you something about what, you, what, what this thing is. Uh, when you look at PubChem, we have this PubChem RDF project where we've been trying to store all the content we have. You know, we have 210 million substances linking to 85 million compounds, is on the order of. Uh, we've got chemical chemical similarity links and, and other types of relationships, which are tens of billions. You know, we've got 225 million bioactivities of 3 million substances and so on. Um, so we, we've been trying to build up knowledge graphs of, of what is really known so that uh, people like you can harness and do something with it, but that it could then integrate with other domains relative to that knowledge. So sort of this whole... Uh, but those are different numbers, and you had on the first slide when I asked you, you had 22 million for compounds and 88 million for substances. No, it was 215 million or so. Yeah, there was a bunch of numbers there. But the idea was just to simply have you look and see that the numbers were large. And, <laughs> and so here, I digested a little bit more for you. So we have on the order of... I understand that. I spent my life with numbers. Too. Right, right. We'll go back and check it out later. <laughs> Uh, so, but we also have um, this issue where we have rather sparse uh, and uh, dense data linking as well. So most chemical or entities have almost nothing known about it. Uh, and we had to, we relate them to the other chemicals that they have dense data uh, by computing some type of similarity between things. And so that computable similarity aspect can be very helpful or useful. But we also have new types of data, links, and metadata on a regular basis. Every time we absorb something new, we have a lot more information we have to classify in some way. So just maintaining the table of contents for this is just, you know, really, really long and getting longer all the time. And we have conflicts where it's like it's the same information and how do you 
uh, convey and display it. All right, so you know, we, we come down to this issue, how do you describe a substance? There's no standards. Um, how do you describe a chemical mixture? No standards, although we may get there with itchy at some point. If you don't know what itchy is, is something that uh, uh, IUPAC has done with NIST. Actually, it's the other way around. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, sort of the lack of standards is a major problem, and it, it's not going to go away. The, the corpus is already, it, the damage is already done. The corpus is already out there, but we're, we're trying to make some sense of it as a function of time. Uh, but again, most chemistry information for humans, not machines. Um, and chemists invent arbitrary conventions to communicate chemical information at a whim. So if something new, they'll just invent something right there on the spot. And it works. So for a human understanding, it's, just, it's about presentation and data. You bring it together and a human gets it. Okay? But, you know, for a computer, um, they don't understand the presentation and they don't understand the data. It doesn't come together for them, that they can't really figure it out. So we, we've been trying to help it along uh, by using triples. Just to give you some idea what a triple is. It's a directed graph. Uh, but the big key thing here for us isn't just the triple, it's the provenance. It's, you know, what was the citation that, that supports this statement? Um, and and who, where did they get that information from? So it's double provenance for us, where most people just maybe single, um, but we've got to figure out who's doing the assertions. And we're very interested about this, about how it changes as a function of time. You might notice a chemical gene link that happened in the 80s that doesn't happen in the 90s. And then maybe reappears in the 2000s, um, and then you, know, you might be able to figure out why or how and what happened there. So, oops, a little too fast there. So as a chemist, you can understand this as acetone and you can associate stuff to it. But for most chemists, this is what, they, what a chemical is. A chemical substance is a picture depicting a chemical, and it's something about it. It's a name, a registry ID. Uh, problem we have, there's just lots of numbers, but the, for a computer, all it really sees is a binary picture. It doesn't really help it. Now, a computer understands a little bit different. Um, a normal human doesn't understand smile strings in terms of a chemical representation. But a computer does with software. It can compute the image. You can also compute, uh, associate other data to that, um, but also compute things like a molecular weight and a chemical structure, uh, a chemical name for it. So if the, if the computer understands, we can really leverage it for a great deal more um, understanding of, of how we can uh, use search analysis and other pieces. So moving along a little bit faster. But we have over 200 million names inside PubChem. And some of the names that you, you find in there, like CAS registry numbers that people throw in, we can't verify or validate that they are exist. They're copyrighted. And you have to pay money to find out if it is a CAS number at all. We don't know. It could be a Baumstein registry number for all we, we know. It could be a Unicode. Uh, we, but then, you know, name to structure associations really change as a function of time. Um, uh, not as a function of time, but um, uh, your use case. So most people think of formaldehyde, but they use the liquid form formalin to refer to formaldehyde. But then formalin, which is uh, in the classic sense, just a liquid, 40% uh, formaldehyde with water. Your, if your use case is non-flammable formaldehyde, if you go below 32%, it has completely different properties. And if you still call this formaldehyde, and you have a fire code and you have a whole tank of, of something there, they want to know if it's flammable or not. And so if, if they can't figure that out, you've got a big problem. Glucose is a horrible example because you have a ring open and ring closed forms. You have two ring closed forms. There's a five-membered ring and a six-membered ring, and it naturally goes in between them. So as you go to different types of solvent systems, you know, the ratios would change. But the really nice thing about chemistry information is you have so many different types of data sources. It's really awesome. We're very blessed in that you can go out almost anywhere and find authoritative content that is important to you. And 
you know, I, uh, gosh, I don't know how many people will have this amount of information. I mean, just for safety data alone, it, it's really, it's awesome. Uh, but the problem is, is that, you know, just like each chemist can do their own thing with drawing a chemical structure, they can go to their own data source, and they don't all agree, sadly, uh, about the content that's there. They have gaps, they have errors, and, you know, when you sit around and ask people what, what data sources they use, Everybody seems to use something different and doesn't know about the other data sources other people use. So, you know, there's lots of fundamental issues that we have here and, and you know, if we can just change some of these aspects about how information is geared uh, and what we um, can do to improve the understanding for computers, I think it's going to go uh, quite a long, uh, long ways. So we've been working towards um, uh, trying to improve knowledge representations uh, we've been having a, a series of workshops and, and uh, symposia to try and, and to sort this out and uh, th there's been basically three or four uh, a year at this point uh, where we're, we're systematically trying to change how we deal with these types of problems. Uh, and to give you some ideas of how this works, we're working with uh, computable ontologies. So these are things that are beyond humans, so that a computer can do. So you can basically break down a, a molecule into lots of different parts and fragments. And you can associate molecular labels to that. You know, it is a benzoic acid, it is a carboxylic acid. But you can also do the functional side, which is that, you know, it, it, it's a treatment for Crohn's disease, uh, you know, or other types of things that's associated with it. You can get sort of a sense of what these are. Um, this is obviously the computable part, and you'd have to associate this content based on what the structure is and what's available for it. It, it makes a comment there that <clears throat> while it's each of those things, it's those things contextually. And just the fact that you identified it as a, there's a pyridine in there, that may not be the active part of the molecule. Ah, but computers, that's where it all is lovely and wonderful because you can do inference and other types of things, and you can find out, ah, oh, is it statistically significant at this point in time? And then you can find out if it is important in that case. <laughs> so, you know, the neat thing here is that you can take a chemical structure, you can name it, um, or you can do operations on it uh, of one form or another. And, you know, we, we now have in the world two different computational classification systems. Uh, one's called Classifier, one, the other one's called Ontichem. This is uh, uh, University of Alberta. Uh, this is a, a, a company that's in Germany that produces this one. Uh, but it, you know, a lot of this kind of works just like um, with the names that you would compute for a given structure. You find different pieces that are there, although it's not very exhaustive. But the problem we already have with two different, comp just two, uh, computational classification systems is that there's almost no overlap. Anything in green here overlaps between the two. A lot of these things are just kind of different, and we come already at this classic thing of, you know, is it an olefin or an alkene? It's the same thing, but we just don't know it's the same thing because they're not speaking the same language. So even harmonization here at this level, at this early stage where you have just two systems, is, is already getting to be a bit of an issue. But we also have this sort of Tower of Babel issue where, you know, we have manual classification and, um, you know, human makes lots of mistakes. We're noticing this because we're trying to rectify uh, the medical subject headings that we do for, um, uh, Medline uh, 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 on the biomedical side, uh, and they can only handle small number of chemical structures. Uh, so even though that there's millions of structures mentioned inside things, um, you know we only refer to a few of those because there aren't enough humans to do all the work. But then you know can we somehow harmonize these in a way that makes sense? So just give you a quick example for benzene. Uh, just look for boiling point. We'll notice that there are two different, very different boiling points that we get for these. And one of the issues is, is that, well, one of these is coal tar, which you might think is a, the natural form of benzene as a distillate from fractionating things. Well, it's there maybe 70 or 80 percent, and it's toluenes and xylenes and other types of hydrocarbons are there. But people commonly refer coal tar to benzene because it's the primary component of that mixture. And sure enough, we find, oh, well, yeah, that's what people have done here. But, you know, if we don't teach the computer how to deal with these things, but the neat thing is, is that 
you know, we're, we're, if we look through the different sources of authoritative data, in this case we're taking a medical subject heading from NLM, World Health Organization, International Label um, Organization, International Chemical Safety Cards, and OSHA, you know, we can start to see some interesting things when you compare the records that they have between them. You can start to find commonalities or gaps so that you can harmonize things in a computational fashion. So we can look at the different uh, concepts that come from these entities. And for us, a concept is nothing more than a bag of names, sadly, because that's what we're reduced to for describing chemical structures and, and or should say chemical substances which we have to use loosely, uh, is that we, we find lots of things that could be do, you know, done to improve uh, MESH so that it includes these other types of uh, non-hierarchical, non-organizational type um, concepts into these schemes. But anyway, um, it's really, it's a work in progress, what we were doing in the chemical sciences. We've only been at it for a couple hundred years. I think we'll finally get there in the next few hundred. Um, so. There's lots of different opportunities to improve the quality, the quantity, the variety, and so on of, of chemical substance content that we have that's available. Really, I think knowledge representation approaches are really going to be the way to go. <coughs> Sadly, um, it, it's just a complete mess, but I think we can make some order out of it. And one of the ways is by looking at how things are, well, um, how would you say, popular. If you keep seeing the same types of things again and again, you get a sense that this is what this community is talking about. But we find is that when we, you, you look across the, the full spectrum is that there are lots of different subconcepts and contexts. And so we can start to piece and, and, and pull some of those out and tease it into something where it makes some real sense. But there's also community efforts underway to try to harmonize these concepts and ontologies in a way that hopefully will make some real sense to you. Uh, with that, it's not the work of one person uh, inside PubChem. There's just a um, small slew of us working on it. Uh, we also have lots of collaborators uh, internally and externally. PubChem has hundreds of, of uh, you know, data sources that come in, which is all voluntary. But uh, with that, I'd be happy to ask any questions you have. Thanks. Yeah, I'm you know, so this is already brought up, but I mean, Google's, a lot of Google's algorithms like PageRank are available. Have you tried that for your full text problem? I mean, they were pretty good in limited domain. Yeah, stack. we rank pretty high. <laughs> yeah. No, so we, we're, we're looking to, to harness Google search and other aspects to try and, and look at how uh, queries make sense. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it's mostly to interpret what is the query about. Google has stale data. They only go every once in a while to pull the content. Our content changes on a daily basis. And you know, maybe they come back once a week, once a month to go through our tens of millions of pages. Um, hopefully they go through some with more frequency than others, although we do know when they, they're doing that. And, uh, I mean, I mean PageRank is pretty fast, so you could actually do it on almost any other scale, right? You, you can. So they, they have products for that, and you, you can purchase these, because there are limits to how many you can do. We serve millions of hits a day, so there's limits to what we could do on a, on, without being on some type of a contractual basis. But well, I mean, they, they have open source implementations of PageRank, right? I mean, you guys could just try it anyway. <coughs> Other questions? A, a couple of things. <clears throat> it's been suggested by people that one should give up and start over. And by that is saying that it's hopeless to convert the existing set of, of, of knowledge that already is into a standardized computer manipulative. So we're back at the Stone Age. Now what? And start over. <laughs> and, and, just, and just start over. Like just saying that we only deal with new information and, and enforce our rules for new information. And uh, I mean, I've heard some people talk about this in a very practical sense. I just. You know, I, I don't think that it would ever be practical to eliminate all of that. But you, know, you, you must get good stuff and you must get bad stuff. And you can say, let's stop dealing with the bad stuff and only, uh, you know, just start with the good stuff and tell the bad stuff, this is what you have to do for us to handle it. Well, knowing when you have a, a gem in the rough is, is sometimes difficult. 
And so there are lots of gems out there. It all depends on the context and what it is that you're looking for. We find that if you have all the content there, people are more happy to look at a more comprehensive set than a selective set. But because our content is changing and we have a constant flux of new content, as things happen, we get it. We get it inside the resource. I mean, Wikipedia only has maybe a few thousand chemical structures defined inside the entire archive. And we have tens of millions, and we're getting more every day. What we have an increasing amount of is dark data. These are things that people had at one point in time, maybe oh. sold, and no longer sell. So that's about a third of the archive now. Otherwise, we'd have over 120 million chemical structures inside PubChem. And we'd have over a quarter, sorry, uh, half a billion chemical substances that have been registered. Right, but of the half a billion, how many are unique? They're not half a billion. 120 million plus all the ones that can't be described as chemical structures. <coughs> so Most of which have no data associated with them aside from the chemical structure. Well, most of what we look at in nature has no data associated with it. Yeah, but right. we see it every day. We yeah. see the trees, we see the, the water, the effluents. <coughs> and but we're not trying to computerize that. Some people would like to. The other question is, have you dealt with chemical uh, reactions yet? Because the differences, for example, in the chemical structure diagrams you, you have, have huge implications on how you algor make algorithms for, for chemical reactions. There are a number of areas of, of distinct um, opportunities in chemistry that we haven't really delved into yet. And they include things like you know, better search systems for chemical biology, uh, large molecule type stuff, which are you know, all atom, all bond, but in some hybrid way. Reactions, uh, spectra of various types. Um, there's more in that uh, patent, although we have patent content, we, we can do a better job with what we do there. Um, we can do some of those things. We have reaction data. Uh, we've had um, data that was mined from the, the patent literature, all the different reactions that were mentioned in those, which were several million, uh, as well as all the products involved. But no, we, we haven't gone too much in that area yet, in part because you need separate specialized search systems allow you to do things with that type of content and and there are people who do want us to take it but James Evans. my pleasure <laughs>